Welcome to the Making the Most of Your Piece of Nature series, hosted by the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry. In this series, we invite you to transform your piece of nature, creating a refuge for native wildlife and insects, and a place to enjoy the beauty of our native flora and fauna. Hello, everyone. My name is Holly May, and I'm the DCNR Service Forester for Armstrong, Clarion, and Jefferson Counties. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Laura Jackson. Laura is a retired science teacher who enjoys nature photography, native plant gardening, birding, and hiking. She lives with her husband, Mike, on their wooded property in Bedford County. So without further ado, here's Laura with Saving Monarchs One Yard at a Time, for making the most of your piece of nature. Welcome to a celebration of monarchs. Saving monarchs, one yard at a time. The first part of our journey together will take us into the mountains of Mexico, where monarchs overwinter. I hope this part will inspire you to take action in your own backyard to protect monarchs. And that's the second part of the program. My husband Mike and I are friends with a geographer who recently married a doctor from Mexico. They are fellow birders and nature enthusiasts. So we collaborated on planning a trip to Mexico to go birding and to visit the monarch sanctuaries. After months of planning, on January the 2nd, 2019, we flew to Mexico and spent nine days exploring just a few of the natural wonders of that wonderful country. It took us just part of a day to make the trip. But monarch butterflies can take up to two months and travel over 2,000 miles to reach their wintering grounds. The area has been designated as the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve. It's a World Heritage Site designed to protect monarch butterflies on their wintering grounds. The actual location was a mystery to scientists for many years, even though local people have known about it for centuries. Dr. Urquhart started tagging monarchs in 1937 and continued for 38 years, but no one could follow the, the butterflies beyond southern Texas. That's where the trail ended. There are different versions of the discovery, but National Geographic notified the world in August 1976. Of course, local people have been celebrating monarch butterflies for ages, and for thousands of years, the annual return of the monarchs were celebrated as spirits of the dead since they returned around the same time as the Day of the Dead Festival on November the 1st. Not all monarch butterflies migrate to Mexico. Almost all of the eastern population flies there, but there are some that stay in Florida year-round. And the monarchs west of the Rockies don't go to Mexico either. They overwinter along the coast in California, and huge eucalyptus trees or fir trees. Most of their habitat has been developed, so there are very few left. In the 1980s, there were 4.5 million western monarchs, but 99.4% of the population is gone. And in 2020, only about 29,000 were counted. And that's below the threshold of 30,000 that biologists think is needed to prevent total collapse. We flew into Cuerto at the top of the screen and traveled by van to the Biosphere Reserve, which is about 62 miles northwest of Mexico City. The Biosphere Reserve was made a sanctuary in 1980 and became a World Heritage Site in 2008. But the lands are still owned privately or community owned. It's not a national park like we have in the United States. 
There are 14 major colonies on 12 isolated mountaintops, and five of those are open to the public. There are about 6 to 60 million butterflies per hectare, which is about 2.5 acres. And in Mexico, they're only found where the sacred Oyamel fir trees grow. The Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve has two zones of protection. The nuclear zone, which you can see is light green, prohibits any logging, and the buffer zone in dark green allows limited logging. The total land is about 60 square miles, but less than 17 square miles is in the nuclear zone. And again, most of this is in community ownership. Unfortunately, the peasant farmers have not been adequately compensated for the logging limitations placed on their land, even though millions of dollars have been spent on helping monarchs. Most of the money goes to large environmental groups and not to the communities to set up sustainable programs. We visited two reserves, Sierra Chinqua and El Rosario, and that's where most of the monarchs overwinter. Here we are at El Rosario. It's the largest and most developed sanctuary, which of course does negatively impact monarch habitat. However, there are many guides to help people stay on the trail and to maintain a quiet atmosphere. You just can't walk wherever you want to. Alfredo was our Mexican guide for the entire trip. He spoke really good English. He used to teach biology in high school and so we really learned a lot from him and got to be good friends. One of the first things that got my attention were all the dead monarchs on the ground beside the trail. We saw massive mortality to begin with, but as we traveled through the woods, we saw hundreds and hundreds of thousands of butterflies. The monarchs clustered on Oyamel fir trees. These high elevation forests are the only place where monarchs overwinter, and this ecosystem is the most endangered in Mexico. Only 2% of the original forest in Mexico remains. But why do monarchs travel here? It's relatively cool and moist. There's a cloud cover during the dry season that helps to pr provide the trees with moisture. The forests are a relic from a time when the earth was cooler and wetter. And since climate change is a real threat, severe winter storms can kill monarchs. It's important that they find just the perfect place where it's not too hot or too dry. It was a warm sunny day when we visited, so the butterflies were active. Even though this video isn't the best, you'll be able to see what it was like to look into the forest and to watch the butterflies dancing through the air. A single tree can protect 20,000 butterflies from winter rain and cold, but it's a very fragile microclimate. Monarchs go into torpor when it's too cold and this conserves energy, but they cluster on south facing slopes so they can take advantage of warmer temperatures. One place when we were standing on the trail, just gazing at all of the butterflies, we heard an exceptional sound. For some reason, thousands of monarchs lifted off at the same time. The flutter of their wings was breathtaking, something that we had never heard before. I had always imagined that the butterflies were just clustered on trees, waiting out the winter, and that is what they do when it's cold and rainy. But we visited on a warm, sunny day, and the butterflies were very active and feeding on flowers. That's what they need is the energy. The worst conditions are heavy snowstorms, which leads to mass mortality. So we watched thousands of monarchs actively nectaring on the wildflowers that grew in sunny patches in the forest. Here's a thistle that attracted a lot of monarchs. We weren't allowed to touch or pick up any monarchs, even if they were dead. But what happens if the butterflies land on you? It's almost a spiritual experience. 
And that's what happened quite frequently. If we were to stop in a sunny spot on the trail, dozens or even up to 20 monarch butterflies might land on us. We just stood still and they just rested on us. It, it was just amazing. Most of the fir trees are gone in Mexico due to climate change, wildfires, illegal logging, and farming. So having the opportunity to visit these high elevation mountains and experience the butterflies was really a magical experience. But we wondered, how did the monarch numbers in the winter when we were there in 2019 compare to other years? Because we knew their population was drastically decreasing. We had learned that the area of the forest covered by monarchs is used to determine the population. In 1995 to 96, there were 50 acres of OML firs covered by monarchs. But that dropped to just 1.66 acres in 2013-14. So when we got home and we started looking at the population returns at the end of that winter, we found out that the monarchs in 2019 covered 15 acres of forest the year that we visited, which was a huge increase. If you look at the graph though, it still shows there's a downward trend. The population is drastically decreasing, but it's just that there was an unexpected increase in monarchs that year. Scientists called it the Goldilocks effect. Everything was just right. An early spring led to early growth of milkweeds, which resulted in a long growing season, and there weren't any huge storms that wiped out monarchs when they migrated in mass numbers. So everything in the summer of 2018 was just right, just in the monarch's favor. But the Three Bears fairy tale ended. When the monarchs left Mexico in the spring of 2019 after we had left, and they flew to South Texas. The spring was very late. The weather was really cold and rainy. There wasn't much milkweed growing. So the monarchs couldn't lay very many eggs and there weren't many larvae that were produced during that spring. So fewer monarchs in the following generations, and you can see that the population in 2020 on this graph decreased by about 50%. If you've ever visited Hawk Mountain or any other hawk watches in Pennsylvania, you might have seen migrating monarchs. They just fly by sporadically on the wind currents, usually one or two at a time. But some hawk watches keep track of the monarchs. And perhaps for the first time we're looking at some data that was collected by several hawk watches in central Pennsylvania. And if you look at the total, you can see in 2017 to 2018 there was a slight increase and then there was a big increase in 2019 which is when the monarchs migrated to Mexico when we visited and then because of that unfortunate spring there was a big drop in number in 2020. So the hawk watches can get a little prediction of what might be happening compared to what happens in Mexico. Are monarchs at risk on their wintering ground? Unfortunately, yes. Even though illegal logging has decreased, it still occurs. Subsistence farming means that trees are still cut to grow agaves and avocados. Climate change is an issue. A winter storm in 2002 killed up to 500 million monarchs. And tourism, just like our national parks, we damage fragile ecosystems when we visit. And unfortunately, two monarch protectors were murdered in 2020 at El Rosario. Can you help protect monarch wintering grounds, even though Mexico is very far away? Here's a hint. You might recognize that as an avocado. When you go to the grocery store, check the label to see where the avocado comes from. If it's from Mexico, you might see this. Or look around and you might some, find some from Florida. Try to buy avocados from Florida, not the ones from Mexico. That means fewer trees will be logged for more avocado plantations. 
But now it's time to leave the wintering grounds in Mexico and head north in early spring. The monarchs that leave Mexico fly to southern Texas, lay their eggs, and then die. The caterpillars that hatch and grow are generation one. When they metamorphose into adult butterflies, those butterflies fly north, lay eggs, and then die, but those eggs hatch into generation two. The process repeats itself as generation three. Finally, near the end of the summer, generation four develops. Some of these butterflies are as far north as Canada. The original butterflies are long since dead, but this generation is the one that flies to Mexico. They don't mate, they're just concentrated on migrating to Mexico. It's called the super generation because they can fly so many thousands of miles. And you can track the monarch's progress on Journey North in the spring and also on the Monarch Watch website. So now we're at part two. We're going to talk about saving monarchs in our backyard. And if you look carefully, even in Pennsylvania as early as June, you might see a monarch laying eggs. The earliest I've ever seen was June 11th. So what can we do to help monarchs in our backyard? Since monarch caterpillars only feed on milkweed, we have to provide this essential food. Scientists say that the common milkweed is the most important milkweed to grow, but there are other species of milkweeds too that are native to Pennsylvania. I especially like butterfly weed, another species of milkweed. It doesn't grow quite as tall as common milkweed, and it's a beautiful orange color. Here's a big swath of it that we planted from seed in 2010. We also planted native grasses and wildflowers in with that seed mix, but it's predominantly butterfly weed. We mow it in early spring, and that's all we've had to do to it since 2010. Butterfly weed can also be grown as a specimen plant in your flower bed or your yard. It's a gorgeous native wildflower. And of course, it attracts a lot of pollinators, including monarch butterflies, which lay their eggs on butterfly weed. And so we're constantly in the summertime looking for the little caterpillars, watching them munch away. And remember, they only feed on milkweed leaves or flowers are very tasty. Another species of native milkweed is the swamp milkweed, also called rose milkweed. It can grow in good garden soil, but it does better when the area is consistently moist, hence the name swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed attracts a lot of butterflies, including monarchs. If you would like to have a pollinator patch of native wildflowers, the first thing has to be done is to kill the grass in your yard. You can do it like my husband is doing. He's spraying herbicide on the grass to kill it. But you might prefer other methods. You can lay down thick cardboard or thick layers of newspaper. You can use black plastic or even clear plastic. You can put down six inches of mulch but you have to wait until that kills the grass. And we know one person who had a large farm field that was a hay field, they plowed it using a disc repeatedly during the summer and then planted the next spring. The second step, once you have the grass killed, is to get the bare ground. You can rotate it till very lightly, no deeper than two inches. And I'll show you another method a little bit later. Of course, I had the unpleasant job of picking up all the rocks. Then we planted native wildflower seed mixes that we purchased from Ernst Seeds in Pennsylvania. Part of the plot, we used Xerxes pollinator mix formulated for Pennsylvania. The other part, we planted showy wildflower mix with native grasses. 
So we had two different sections. We mixed the seed with kitty litter for more even distribution. And then Mike used a cyclone seeder to spread the seed in two directions perpendicular to each other. Then it's important to compact the seed into the soil. If you don't have a roller, you can just use a lawnmower and drive back and forth over the bare soil. And then the last step is beyond our control. Pray for rain. We were lucky when we planted the seeds in 2015. We had several days of rainy weather afterwards and the seeds germinated pretty quickly. This is what the plot looked like the next spring. This is when the Coreopsis was blooming in June. And again, these are the two different plots of wildflower mixes that we planted from Ernst Seed. Later in the summer, and you'll see that, it's a much different look. And here's a close-up of a common pollinator, a soldier beetle, on the Coreopsis. This photo was taken three years after we planted the same plot, and later in the summer, to show some of the grasses and native wildflowers that were in bloom. Yes, wildflower seed is expensive, but there are lots of benefits. If you have a yard of grass, there's constant mowing, fertilizer, you might need to water it. It's tedious, it's hard work. On the other hand, if you have a yard of native wildflowers, you only need to plant them once and then mow early in the spring the following years. You never have to fertilize them. You don't have to water them. You never use herbicide. You don't have to dig the weeds out. And your yard will be exciting, colorful. You'll have pollinators. You'll have birds feeding on the seeds in the fall. You can take your children or grandchildren to explore. This is what my husband looks like when he had to mow the yard. And compare that to a happy family that's enjoying the wildflowers. This video says it's best. This is our wildflower plot, a typical summer morning. Lots of butterflies, lots of bees, flies, beetles all sorts of pollinators and then like I said later on in summer the birds start feeding on the seeds. We're lucky we live in the country we don't have any township regulations that limit the height of our lawn but signage is a useful tool and let your municipal officials know in advance of what you plan to do. Then put up signs and make sure there's a mowed boundary around your wildflower plot to set off the planting. And you can get different kinds of signs or make your own sign. Once a year in early spring, we usually mow. And that's when the turkeys are gobbling and strutting. And you can see in the foreground, that same patch has been mowed. Sometimes though, it's hard to mow as early as we'd like because the ground is too wet. One year we didn't get mowed until the red buds and the dogwoods were blooming. But we can also use a rotation and we've started doing that where we mow only one third of our pollinator plantings each year. Last spring we planted two and a half acres of wildflowers, including a small strip along our garden in late May. We wanted this patch to be shorter which might be more appropriate if you live in town. So we did our research and we checked with Ernst Seeds and picked out some shorter plants that would flower throughout the summer. And it's important to have a variety of dates and times when the flowers will be blooming. So Ernst put the seed mix together for us in the different proportions that you see. Partridge pea is an annual that readily reseeds and it bloomed the first summer. Uh, we want a butterfly weed, of course. Lance leaf coreopsis, which blooms in June. Uh, sundrops also bloom in June. The aromatic aster blooms later. Narrow leaf mountain mint is a great pollinator. And also hairy beard tongue, which is a type of penstemon. 
We ordered the seeds from Ernst in February and we stored them for a couple months in the refrigerator hoping that that would trick them into germinating when we planted them. And this time we didn't rototill. We just made sure we had plenty of bare soil and again Mike used the cyclone seeder to spread the seeds. We compacted the soil using the roller again pushing the seeds into the dirt and then this time we spread the area with a light layer of straw as mulch. This is something that Ernst is now recommending. We didn't have a lot of rain but we had enough so we had good germination and we were really surprised when we started looking at the milkweed plants in early June that we found monarch caterpillars and here's a picture we took on July 24th to show those caterpillars munching away on butterfly weed that we had just planted in May. Because this butterfly weed was planted last spring it bloomed later in the summer and we had huge numbers of spice bush swallowtails and monarchs nectaring on the flowers. I counted 25 butterflies on August the 18th on a sunny morning. 23 spicebush swallowtails, one sulfur, and one monarch butterfly. Please remember though, it's the common milkweed that nourishes the most monarchs. I talked to a research biologist at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who told me that there's a 1.8 billion shortfall of milkweed stems. That translates into 600 million plants. And that population existed about 20 years ago. But now, due to a lot of herbicides and other issues, those milkweeds are gone. So agencies are working with farmers to try to get that number back, especially in the Midwest. You can buy milkweed plants from the big box stores, but make sure they're pesticide free. Some do treat their plants with neonicotinoids, which could kill the caterpillars, so make sure you check that the plants are pesticide free. This is another field that we call milkweed meadow, where we're cultivating as much common milkweed as we can. It's about an acre in size. You can see it's covered with common milkweed and we get hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of butterflies including monarchs every summer. I've watched monarch butterflies laying eggs on milkweed plants. They lay just one egg at a time and then fly to another plant. So I've watched the eggs and photographed them. It takes four to five days for an egg to hatch depending on the temperature. Egg number one I photographed just a few hours after the egg was laid. That's the one in the upper left hand corner. I thought maybe the egg would get bigger as the days went by, but you can see from day two and day three and day four the eggs really aren't bigger. I really couldn't tell any difference in size. But on day five the end of the egg turned black, indicating it was about to hatch. Unfortunately, I missed the actual hatching. But here's the little caterpillar. This is what it looks like just a few hours after hatching. It already ate the eggshell. It's very tiny, but is protected from predators because as soon as it starts eating milkweed, the toxins from milkweed build up in its body making it poisonous to predators. Monarch caterpillars like other caterpillars are eating machines. They grow quickly and molt their skin at least five times before it's time to pupate. They usually crawl 20 to 30 feet away from the milkweed plant and attach it to another plant or object before forming the chrysalis. The beautiful gold spots just aren't decoration they actually affect metamorphosis. After a few days of a magical transformation, the monarch butterfly emerges from the chrysalis. It has gained wings, lost its chewing mouth parts, and now has the ability to fly. If it's the super generation, 
mating is put on hold and the urge to migrate takes over. This part of the monarch's life cycle is when it's most at risk. So we homeowners can help monarchs by providing native flowers that bloom late in the summer. One of my favorites is shown here, wild ageratum. It's a beautiful bloom. Its nectar attracts a lot of butterflies and it blooms from August to October. And this is a migrating monarch. Wild ageratum is easy to grow from seed and it spreads pretty easily. Another late bloomer is aromatic aster. It will grow well in dry soil. It's very fragrant, so rabbits and deer tend to ignore it, but it really attracts the monarchs and it blooms into late October. Aromatic aster doesn't grow as tall as some of the other asters, so it's attractive in the front of a flower bed. I love the contrast of the bright orange and black monarch with the colorful aromatic aster. Another thing to remember is try to keep your yard and your garden pesticide free. Also, try to buy corn and soy products that are non-GMOs. Farmers that grow non-GMOs use less herbicide and that protects the millions of milkweeds that grow along the edges of farm fields. And don't forget to look at these websites. Monarch Watch is a great resource. Journey North, I've already mentioned those. And here's another one, Monarch Joint Venture. Lots of inspiration and information in these websites. I hope sharing just a bit of my trip to Mexico will inspire you to help monarchs in your yard. And I hope you've enjoyed the pictures and our time together. If you'd like more details on how to grow pollinator plots or to grow wildflowers from seeds, please feel free to contact me. Here's my email, jacksonlara73 at gmail.com. And I'd also like to share with you more information about my trip to Mexico. In fact, my friends who organized the first trip are planning another one in the winter of 2022. So if you would be interested in going, contact me and I'll send you their information. So thank you for allowing me to share some information with you and some beautiful pictures. Thank you for joining the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry for our Making the Most of Your Piece of Nature video series. If you're interested in learning more about this topic or others, please visit DCNR's website where you can find information on landscaping with native plants, invasive plants, and a list of service forester by county. Your service forester is a free resource to help you make the most of your piece of nature.